Hello and welcome to Make It Conscious. This is Max and this is the first episode of a new podcast series that I am launching. My plan is to do at least one of these every week. Sometimes might be more. Never know what might happen. It sometimes might be a little bit less. But essentially this podcast is all going to be about demystifying spirituality, examining the issues of the day from a psycho-spiritual perspective as a means to that, and gleaning what we can about what is going on in the world as a way to improve the quality of our own spiritual practice, our own spiritual growth, and how we can be of more use to ourselves and to others through that process. So today I really want to go straight to the basics. I can't promise I'll keep it basic, but I'm going to be covering at least a basic topic. That is what is spirituality. And in some ways, this whole show is about answering that question. What is spirituality really? As I look around and I consume content myself, look at YouTube, Instagram, there's definitely a split in terms of what I would consider to be influencers who get it, really understand what genuine spiritual growth actually consists of. And there's also those that are more involved in what I would consider to be pop spirituality. And I would certainly say that the the latter group is much larger than the former group. But I do believe there are some pretty clear cut and definable differences in the way each of those groups sees the world and makes decisions in the world. And as part of this particular episode, I'd really like to delineate what that difference is. So I've prepared a few slides here, but this is intended to be a very listenable piece. So I'll make sure that this is very much something you can just listen to as a podcast and it won't matter so much if you can't see the slides. Now, so the topic of today's episode is what is spirituality really? And this is foundational to pretty much everything else I would like to go on and talk about over the coming months and years. Any coaching interaction that I have, any lessons that I give are really going to be built off this very foundational understanding of what spirituality actually is. And I think that it's critical in this particular day and age, as we've seen our understanding of religion and spirituality diverge massively. Like they're clearly not the same thing. So, you know, what is the difference between them? What, what is it that we need to be doing here? And what is it we're best off avoiding or perhaps is actually doing harm to us? So what is spirituality really? So before I go ahead and dive into how we can actually define spirituality, just want to iterate why I think spirituality matters. This would all become clear, but I believe that spirituality matters because all of the challenges us humans face, whether it's as individuals, whether it's in organizations, and certainly as society as a whole, these challenges can all be construed as spiritual challenges. And that includes financial trouble, loss of meaning or direction, emotional upset, anger, sadness, being out of control emotionally, discord between people and groups of people, loneliness, disconnection, addiction, reliance on external things, substances or otherwise, or even to certain thoughts. Codependency, so relying on other people as a way to regulate unresolved feelings that we're not taking responsibility for. And all forms of confusion. These can all be construed as spiritual challenges because all of these on some level arise from our own inner psychological conflicts and disconnection from parts of ourselves, that is unseen parts of ourselves, which stretches far beyond how we consciously think of ourselves and what we are consciously aware of. So we're going to be getting into all of this. This is very much in line with the Jungian school of thought, not to mention the rest of modern psychology. So a key point at the heart of this message is to, to ground ourselves in the understanding of where we are. And that is that our society's current modus operandi can best be captured by the word materialism. Now, by materialism, I don't mean 
merely materialistic. I don't mean going shopping, abusing the planet by using excessive plastic and so on, although that is a symptom of materialism. Materialism is really a paradigm. It's a way of thinking and grounding ourselves in the world. What it means is that matter is the forerunner. That's the way we structure, the way we perceive the world and behave in the world at the moment. We believe that we exist in a physical world and that our consciousness is a product of that. And therefore, by consequence, if only we can make the world a certain way, can wrangle with the external world, if we can all agree on just the right set of values or the right set of rules or the right systems that are objectively best for everybody, regardless of how we can actually figure that out in, in practice, then we'll be okay, right? If we can just fix the world, make it perfect, finally, we'll get there, then we'll all be fine permanently. Now, I think if you really questioned this, a, a lot of people don't really think that. You know, the wisdom that counters that is pretty trite. You know, I mean, you see it on Instagram every day. But the way we behave is very much as though that is true. If we can just make the world perfect, get about our minds, don't have to go there, We'd rather not go there, right? We can just fix the world, then we'll live happily ever after. So that's the way we are structuring our society currently. It's uh, been going since pretty much the Enlightenment, so 1600s. I mean, it, it's, it's always existed in some form, but it's become very much bolstered in the last 400 years or so as materialist science has gained ground and has been very successful in improving our quality of lives, no doubt. But the externalities of the materialist approach are becoming undeniable today. So by externalities, we mean unforeseen consequences, outcomes that are external to the economic transaction. So it's like we drill for oil, we burn the oil, we kick a load of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. We all oh, didn't consider that. Okay, so there's a damage cost associated with that. And so the externalities of zoning in on what we thought was the point has actually caused us to misdirect our attention away from what was really the point, which ultimately is our own well-being, you could argue, however you want to think of that, and our own spiritual growth, our own coming to consciousness. So the damage being done is undeniable, and we're seeing it in many areas now, certainly our environment, in our dysfunctional economy, where we have fallen in love with the symbol of contribution, this currency, this money, and we're maximizing money for its own sake. But in doing that, we actually take our attention away from the reason we wanted the money in the first place. So this is coming about in the form of central banks printing excessive amounts of currency, for example. Currency, of course, not having in inherent value in itself, but merely representing something. So in falling in love with the symbol of this contribution, this economic energy, we've been cheating on the real thing. And this has happened in civilizations many times, happened in the Roman times, for example. It happened in the Weimar Republic. It's happening in modern times in various countries around the world, Venezuela, Lebanon, where the inflation has just run amok with no, no way of going back. So moving on from that, we see the externalities of materialism in our suffering mental health. Because in pursuing material, all the the wonderful material things that make us happy temporarily, we actually then start to project parts of ourselves into these external objects and end up suffering when they inevitably decay or when we can't get more of them or, or because simply we don't control those things because they're not inherent to us. They are external representations of something. Chronic disease is another way in which this paradigm is showing up. For example, in the, the refined sugar that's in all of our foods, in vegetable seed oils, these things that are now being proven to cause chronic disease. But of course, our body and our mind find these things delicious because to our taste buds, you know, sugar looks like the thing we need. It looks like survival, right? It looks like the thing that's going to give us long life. But really, it's a refinement of 
something that was in its original form quite wholesome in moderation but in this refined form it, it's confusing to our bodies so we fall in love again with the symbol and cheat on the real thing become sick and and overweight and diabetic and so on materialism shows up in codependency codependency in my mind being when we are part of a, a, an interaction where people are leaning on each other to regulate their feelings so it's about when we want other people to make us happy, right? And I want to make you happy as opposed to let's both be whole in ourselves and grow together, right? Let's actually take responsibility for our own mind and our own feelings and engage with each other in that journey rather than using each other to regulate things that we ourselves are not willing to take responsibility for. And this is like the idea of love that we're actually fed by much of our media, right? And uh, I'm not making any claims as to whether that's deliberate or intentionally sinister or anything like that, but it does nonetheless happen. And it's actually quite understandable why it might happen within the materialist paradigm. Because if everything's material, then we just need other people that we fit with, right? To come and show up and, and make us happy. But it's like they're not permanent, we're not permanent. So we're not going to be a permanent match for each other unless we can actually move and grow together and take responsibility as a way of doing that so in this sense codependency pretty much sits in polarity to what i would consider sovereignty which is wholeness in yourself that's really what freedom is right that is psychic freedom which then shows up in in real world freedom but but sovereignty is about being whole in yourself not being perturbed by what's going on in the world not having it impinge upon attachments not giving up your own ability to be content and placing that onto external objects and people. That's sovereignty. Codependency is the materialist approach to relationships. And it's actually way more common than most of us would realize. It's actually pervasive right now. We tend to call it codependency when it blows up in some kind of argument or something. But you know, really what it is, is, is a materialist approach to relationships. And finally in this list pop spirituality genuine spirituality often doesn't look like spirituality because if we're needing to look like spirituality it's usually because we're compensating for something in the unconscious and so we have a lot of what i would refer to as pop spirituality you know it looks like spirituality it has all the right symbols the right clothing the right incense sticks right it looks very much like spirituality but it's not necessarily the real thing it's actually maybe even a bypass from the real thing what is the real thing we're going to get onto that but i've alluded to it here in this list so clearly the materialist view is causing quite a few issues here but what does it have to say about the alternative well even in materialist science there are certain data points appearing that just don't seem to fit the model such as in quantum physics. In this study, it suggested that our consciousness itself plays a role in what appears to us as happening in the world. Now, of course, there's the old saying, isn't there, that if you think you understand quantum theory, you don't understand quantum theory. Uh, I don't think I understand quantum theory. Um, I guess that also means I don't understand quantum theory. But what I do understand is that the consciousness does play a role in what appears to us as happening in the world. In fact, what is happening in the world is happening in our consciousness. There's simply no way around that. That's actually empirically true. Likewise, in neuroscience, there are things happening which do not fit with the materialist model. There's an example of this from about 70 years ago, which was the split brain experiments. Now, in these particular experiments, they took epileptic patients and split the two hemispheres of their brain. They cut what's known as the corpus callosum between the two sides of the brain. And then they would do things like ask one side of the brain to get up and walk across the room and then ask the other side of the brain what it was doing. And the other side of the brain would confabulate a reason. It would say, oh, I'm going to buy a can of drink. 
And so presumably that side of the brain thought it was being completely coherent and making perfect sense and perhaps didn't even realize it was confabulating, right? Well, this certainly doesn't seem to fit with the materialist model, which doesn't really have much to say on consciousness, consciousness itself. And it does make you wonder if we aren't all doing this at some point to some degree much of the time, like making sense of our experience through the ego. So I'll leave that point there. I believe personally that a true understanding of spirituality and the path to the real solutions to the problems we're facing right now, individually and societally, comes from opening up to an idealist paradigm. So I wanted to make this point first because this is actually fundamental. If we're not talking about the alternatives to materialism, then we're still looking at this subject of spirituality through a materialist lens. And that is a way to get yourself very tied up in knots. You see this in all the major religions, like they can help to a point. They can provide great wisdom and advice for navigating the contradictions of life and integrating our minds to a point through that. But as long as we view them for a materialist paradigm, I believe we're going to get ourselves quite confused about what is really going on here and what spiritual growth actually means. So, so what is an idealist paradigm? Well, let's turn to a quote from a chap called Charles Seeley. He summarizes it quite neatly. And he says that idealism is based on the theory that mind is primary and that matter is secondary. It holds that ideas are produced by the mind and are the only things that are known or can be known and that matter is unreal and cannot be known. So to be clear, idealism is a whole field of study. It, not all idealists agree with each other, right? It's just a very general area that stands as an alternative to materialism, which is also a vast general area. It's an entirely different paradigm. And it, all it's simply saying is that it's not that mind appears in matter, it's that matter appears in mind. As Charles says, that, that matter is secondary. It's not necessarily even saying that matter doesn't exist or that there isn't a world out there, but that it cannot be known in its pure form. It can only be known in the mind, filtered by the mind. And actually, in the deepest empirical sense, all we can know is the mind. And this actually is acknowledged to a large degree in materialist science. I want to turn now to a quote by the philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein. And he asked a friend, he said, tell me, why do people always say it was natural for man to assume that the sun went round the earth? rather than that the earth was rotating. And Wittgenstein's friend replied, well, obviously because it just looks as though the sun is going round the earth. He replied, well, what would it have looked like if it looked as though the earth was rotating? So I would extend that same way of thinking to the materialist view and idealism and ask, materialism assumes that the mind revolves around external reality or that the mind appears in material. But how would it look if it were the other way around? How would it look if matter was actually a product of mind? Would it necessarily look any different? And if you've had experiences that actually allude to this being true, that actually the matter and the world you experience is a product of mind, or even your mind, I would say that you're not only not unusual in having those kinds of experiences, synchronicities and so on, but that actually you might be tapping into the true nature of things and that actually maybe we need to be thinking about this as an alternative paradigm. The truth is that all we can really know is our own minds. It is literally all we can know. And that the materialist view, therefore, despite being so rational and scientific and purporting to be understanding an objective reality quite impressively fails to see that it is itself making an assumption 
in that it thinks that what it is seeing is the way it is. Of course, it deduces and it uses all kinds of logic to prove certain things about the way our experience unfolds to us. But it goes a step too far in assuming that that is something objective and that it's not simply being filtered by our minds. So it infers a material world from experience and it misses the mind or the role of mind and consciousness. And so therefore it confuses the unreal for the real. It believes that the world out there is the real thing. And if we can just get the world to meet our needs then everything will be fine. But what I'm suggesting here in line with an idealist view is that the matter and the objects that we pursue are merely representations of something more primary that actually comes from our, ourselves, comes from our mind. And so if we confuse the unreal for the real, we end up chasing objects like a mirage and actually end up giving up our own sovereignty, our own ability to stand on our own, be content and become attached to these external objects. We come to confuse them for the real point. And so materialism chases substitutes in place of real growth. It wants the income, the job title, the sports car. It wants the symbols of spirituality. It wants the clothes and so on. But actually it's doing that in place of real growth. I'll just add that a lot of idealist ideas are actually acknowledged to a degree in today's science. We simply cannot get around them. So we might be told, for example, that what we are experiencing is not the world, but it's neurons firing in the brain. So if we, say, burn our finger on a hot stove, we're not really feeling a hot stove. We're feeling neurons in our finger telling our brain that something is wrong with the body, or that there's danger. So even materialist science has to acknowledge that we're not really experiencing a world. We are and can only be experiencing our mind, but they might phrase it in terms of we're experiencing the brain, neurons firing in the brain, neurotransmitters, and so on. It doesn't explain how those things create a conscious experience. It just says that we're not really experiencing, you know, the world, the room, this glass of water, my burnt finger on the stove. We're experiencing neurons of various kinds firing. In medicine, we consider the role of psychosomatic symptoms, right? Like we know that there is such a thing as the mind affecting the body. We can't necessarily explain why that's happening, but we can't deny it's happening. We have to account for this. Like if we're really worried about a certain injury, for example, it sort of gets worse, right? And if we keep thinking about it, we keep focusing on it. This actually happened to me uh, uh, about 12 years ago before I understood this stuff well. I had a knee injury that just got worse and worse and worse. And uh, the physiotherapist told me like, she said, it's not in your head, Max. Like you do have more nerve cells there now. You do have a higher volume, the way she described it, like, like the volume switch has turned up in your nerve cells, but it's because you've been focusing on it so much. So there's absolutely a mind-body connection. And of course, the effects of placebos in clinical trials. We have to do double-blind tests and so on because we understand that if a person thinks they're taking a medicine that is meant to help them, then they're more likely to get better. So they have to do double-blind studies where they don't tell people if what they're having is a placebo or not. So they can test for the real chemical influence of a drug. All of these factors are nonetheless considered auxiliary to an otherwise materialist model. They're factors, we know that they affect our results, but we can't really place them into the model neatly. We just sort of have to bolt them on and go, oh, this is, this is something that's happening. Okay, let's just try and model that. But it's a model that sort of helps us produce results, but it doesn't really explain what is actually happening. It can't because it's assuming an external world and that, that we exist in a world despite the fact that it knows we only experience our mind and can only experience our minds. So bringing this back to the main thread, we might regard our challenges not as material challenges to be overcome, but spiritual challenges to be resolved. 
And if the challenges we each face can be construed as spiritual challenges, then any solutions for these challenges can be construed as spiritual solutions. And if we're able to frame them as such, we can craft real solutions that bring about lasting change by getting to work on the mind itself. These words, by the way, are from a blog post I wrote recently. It's called What We Are Missing About Spirituality. So you're welcome to go check that out on the makeitconscious.com blog. But now to a quote from Carl Jung. He said, I have treated many hundreds of patients. Among those in the second half of life, that is to say over 35, there has not been one whose problem in the last resort was not that of finding a religious outlook on life. It is safe to say that every one of them fell ill because he had lost that which the living religions of every age have given their followers and none of them has really been healed who did not regain his religious outlook. Now, I think that's an incredibly powerful quote, you know, bearing in mind that Carl Jung was very involved in working with people face to face. He wasn't merely a thinker. He wasn't merely someone who just wrote about philosophy and uncovered new ideas in philosophy. He was working with real people every day. And bear in mind, he said this in the 1930s in German. So, and I don't know what he originally meant by religious necessarily, but I think today we might say it was not about necessarily finding a religious outlook on life, but a spiritual outlook on life. Because clearly religion and spirituality aren't the same thing. And yet, for all the importance of spirituality to our lives, we no longer seem to have agreements on what spirituality actually means. And hence why I've been asked a couple of times, like, well, what is spirituality? What do you mean by spirituality? What does this actually mean? Is spirituality tied to religion? Can you be spiritual without religion? And if science has dispelled religion as we used to know it, then what exactly is spirituality? And where does it fit in our modern lives? Well, need we look further than Collins Dictionary? Probably we will have to, but let's actually just see what the dictionary says about spirituality. Collins Dictionary defines it as, one, the state or quality of being dedicated to God, religion, or spiritual things or values, especially as contrasted with material or temporal ones. Two, the condition or quality of being spiritual. Three, a distinctive approach to religion or prayer. It further defines spiritual as relating to people's thoughts and beliefs rather than to their bodies and physical surroundings. Now, I think that anyone who's found genuine solutions to their worldly problems is going to find that definition pretty impoverished with its references to belief and religion. So clearly, our dictionaries aren't gar grasping what we mean by spirituality. And I think that this difficulty is not surprising given what science and psychology have brought to the table over the last 150 years. The changing role of organized religion over that time and the hole that it has left in the modern psyche. Now, it's all good and well disproving religion, all good and well pointing out that you know, the statue of Jesus is not actually Jesus. There's a lot of useful knowledge that's contained outside the Bible. And by the same token, there's a lot that's in the Bible that perhaps isn't especially helpful. But does that mean that we ought to throw out religion entirely? Are we in danger of throwing the baby out with the bathwater? Actually, I think that's exactly what happened, and that is certainly a, a Jungian idea. So here's how I think of spirituality. Call it a definition, if you like. I think of spirituality as being the interest that we all have in aligning ourselves with what is beyond the ego. What do we mean by what is? Well, it's built on the innate understanding that there is more to ourselves and existence than our immediate experience suggests. And it involves an openness to the notion of and interaction with the unconscious mind. 
that's really key because that's something that religion actually misses. It works to help people engage with the unconscious mind, but it doesn't understand the unconscious mind. It doesn't do it in knowledge that that is what is going on. You know, it believes that the truth is in the book or that, that you know, Jesus was the actual literal only savior and this kind of thing. Not that these things represented the ideals, right? The idealist paradigm might be, well, these actually represent ideals within us. They're not the real thing. And so after all, there is more to existence than the conscious ego purports. And the misalignment between the ego and this greater whole is both the origin of suffering and the source of meaning in our lives. And this understanding is innate. It, it, we just know it. Right? We know there's more to this. We know that there's more outside of our conscious ego. And we sometimes spend our entire lives trying to make conscious sense of that fact and being humbled time and time again when we can't quite figure it out, at least not entirely. Three, there is such a thing as the unconscious. Although it's not best described as a thing at all, but vast expanses of mind and potential of which we're not aware. And religion has historically provided the vital means of engaging with it. And four, it is therefore possible to practice a spiritual life without necessarily being religious. Right? So if spirituality is simply aligning ourselves with what is beyond the conscious ego, engaging with the unconscious, then we need not follow an organized religion in order to do that necessarily. I'm not saying religion isn't, isn't helpful, but that it isn't necessary to live a spiritual life, to grow spiritually, and indeed to solve the multitude of our challenges with spiritual solutions through spiritual growth by becoming more conscious. So it is spirituality as understood in this way that provides the path towards meaning, wholeness, congruency, and becoming our true selves. Now, I believe that there are no problems outside of our mind. In fact, there's nothing we experience outside of our mind, right? This is the idealist paradigm. There's nothing that, can you, can you point to anything? Can you talk about anything that exists outside of your mind? I mean, by default, everything we experience must be happening in our mind. And so the world technically is not actually the problem. It's how our mind relates to our experience that creates the perception of problems. And you can do something about it because your mind is giving rise to it. So we can address our issues by addressing our minds and making the unconscious conscious. And this is what materialism misses. So this whole episode is really talking about like, what is it that the materialist paradigm misses out on? And in a nutshell, it is the fact that not only is there an idealist alternative to to way of navigating our, our experience here, but that it actually leaves out or maybe just gives a footnote to this whole idea of the unconscious this whole vast expanse of mind and potential that absolutely not only plays a role in our lives but is pretty much dictating our lives much of the time without us even realizing it and that the path to spiritual growth therefore is the process of making the unconscious conscious that is what consciousness development is and so without a concept for the unconscious, right? And therefore, without at least an openness to the idealist point of view, what even is spirituality without those ideas? It's quite hard to conceive of. And yet we all know what it looks like. And I say we know what it looks like because it's a materialist take on something that's actually inherent and so we can get ourselves quite confused when we chase spirituality, chase religion, do these things that look like spirituality, remind our inner selves of something that's there, that's something that we, we, we're trying to make conscious, but it never quite pushes those buttons permanently. It always seems to fall short of the real thing. 
So I've defined what spirituality is. So therefore, a spiritual disinterest. So if we're completely unspiritually minded, disconnected from ourselves, as is much of the corporate world, for example, as is much of much of modern society, actually. Well, spiritual disinterest is characterized by the view that there's no such thing as the unconscious. There's no, there's no such thing as the unconscious. What I see is what there is. The way I see the world is more or less the way it is, right? Or at least that you're the only person who doesn't have one. So we can probably relate to this kind of, let's call it an archetype, right? Probably is an archetype of sorts of people who are on one hand, very, very worldly, not interested in spiritual matters at all, very skeptical of such things, let's say, but at the same time are able to manipulate others through their unconscious mind, but doing so unconsciously. So cult leaders fall into this category to a degree, even though they may claim to be spiritual, they actually almost by default don't understand the unconscious mind, because if they did, they wouldn't feel the need to exploit others in the way that they do. And yet they, at the same time, understand that they can manipulate people to a degree and they know what works, but they can't in its pure form really explain why it works because they don't have a concept that's well fleshed out for the unconscious mind. So I'm coming to the end of my little presentation here, but I just wanted to read to you a comment that I received recently on Facebook. As I've been exploring more ideas, as I've been posting more content about psycho-spirituality and spiritual growth, I've started to receive feedback, both uh, kind feedback, both constructive feedback, as well as harsh feedback, uh, criticism, and outright attacks. So I think that's inevitable. <laughs> and I think it's uh, in some ways, in some ways, a um, encouraging sign that the things I'm saying are pushing buttons with some people that it impinges upon their attachments or their shadow material. I won't go so far as to say it's always a good sign to receive attacks and hostility because it could just be that, you know, one was doing something harmful and brought it on themselves in that way. But in this case, uh, I've received a lot of criticism from a particular ex-colleague of mine from 13 years ago. And so in this post here, he asks a barrage of questions. He asks, uh, what is psycho-spiritual? And what empirical evidence is there to justify its leg legitimacy as a concept? So hopefully in this presentation here, I've actually answered that, uh, at least in part. So psycho-spiritual is really just like the combination of psychology and spirituality. It's where those two things meet. But at their core, I don't think those things really are separable. You know, I refer to myself as a psycho-spiritual coach because it is very precise and it neatly defines what I'm about in a way that is likely to be understood by others, people who are interested in psychology and spirituality. But really, in my view, psychology and spirituality are not separable at all. You know, they are both concerned with the evolution of consciousness. And in fact, I think everything, as I've said a couple of times already throughout this, this podcast, everything can be construed as spiritual. Everything can be construed as a means to spiritual growth as either a vehicle or a trap, right? So what is psycho-spiritual? It's just what I'm talking about here. It's psycho-spiritual growth. And what empirical evidence is there to justify its legitimacy as a concept, right? It must exist in the world for me to even think about it, right? <laughs> Maybe it's the other way around, right? Maybe actually uh, it must exist in our minds in order for it to appear in the world. Have we thought about that? Have we considered that as a possibility? Anyway, but to, to offer some hard evidence in response to this question, I think the quote from Jung about how he found that in his extensive therapeutic practice in people of uh, 35 years and above, it was only those who rediscovered spirituality that actually found lasting solutions to their neuroses. So I think that's pretty legitimate evidence of the usefulness of psychospirituality as a concept. What indeed is spirit or spiritual? Well, I haven't tried to define spirit, but I have defined spiritual in this show. 
how do we tell the difference between people who are genuinely educated in verifiable and demonstrably real elements of objective reality and people who are simply conveyors of pseudoscience and deepities with the confidence with which they assert their claims, substituting for any actual demonstration <gasps> that there is anything to do what they claim. Um, well, I actually wrote a book about this, right? An 80 page ebook called The Cult Recovery Guide. And in there, I talk about certainly how you can spot people with very, very rigid persona, uh, people who are determined to uphold that persona at any cost, even if it means you know, their own death people who will fight tooth and nail, for example, when they see ideas that they uh, find displeasing or that go against their existing paradigm. Um, you know, I, I talk about that in depth in that book. But how can we tell who is genuinely educated in verifiable and demonstrable real elements of objective reality? Uh, I think that everybody experiences objective reality to the same extent, which is not at all. Uh, we experience our own minds. And so none of us actually know what objective reality is. We only know our own subjective experience. He goes on, uh, what process and methodologies have you subjected yourself to in order to attempt to falsify your own claims? Uh, I don't think I've made any claims as such. I think uh, I've defined what spirituality is, in my opinion, and explained why spirituality matters and a little bit on why I think the materialist paradigm is problematic and that we're seeing evidence of that which is becoming undeniable not just to philosophers and coaches and spiritual teachers and, and followers but to the mainstream now um you know everybody is experiencing the results of the impact on the environment on the economy on mental health on our nutrition and on the kinds of relationships we're having in society which we've tried to normalize to a point but it's becoming very hard to do that going forward you know it's becoming just untenable so there we have it that is how i think about spirituality and i hope that has been useful in this episode i really talked about what materialism and the current paradigm really misses and why as a result of that we're struggling to really understand what spirituality actually means and as a potential solution to that i've suggested there's actually a whole other paradigm we can turn to which is the idealist paradigm that means that mind is the forerunner if we take that point of view, spirituality then starts to make a lot more sense. So in this episode, I've talked about what materialism misses. And in the next episode, I'm going to move on to religion, talk about what religion misses in the understanding of spirituality and spiritual growth and how we can actually use that understanding as a way to develop our own spiritual practice. And then in the episode after that, I'm going to be talking about spiritual growth and the way of life that's required in order to move us in that direction and that is in essence what psychology in its modern form misses so i've talked about materialism i'm going to talk about religion and i'm going to talk about psychology i'm going to bring that all together and really understand what spiritual growth actually consists of and the practical techniques that will work for us to move us in that direction and why they work that's really important so there you go guys i hope that has been useful and i shall see you in the next episode thank you